Hurricane Sandy is remembered for its massive impact on the northeast U.S. coast. But earlier in its path, this was a storm that underwent rapid intensification prior to landfall in Cuba. Sandy was not a surprise. We made a good forecast. Uh, Sandy uh, went from a category one hurricane to a category three hurricane only 17 hours. So it was a very fast uh, increase in intensity. When it passed over Cuba, Sandy was a major category three hurricane. But at landfall in the USA, it had weakened to a category one or less. Even then, its size and the effects of the storm surge wave heights caught many by surprise. This is the back of our safari ride. As you can see, the water came out from underneath the boardwalk and took up all the piling, all the, all the boardwalk ramps, and uh, did some pretty good damage into this ride and the pier that's uh, connected to it. 10 to 15 seconds, it'd be gone. It was like going about 50 miles an hour heading south. Something I've never seen before, and, and I, then I realized that there was some real destruction going on because I'm seeing almost whole sides of houses going past my house in the ocean. What I saw was three foot of ocean water coming down both sides of the street. After looking at the waves for 10 minutes, I realized that all the oceanfront homes were gonna get punched out. You know, there wasn't very much rain. The rain was very light, but the wind was, was absolutely incredible. You know, I've never, ever, even with all the other hurricanes that have, you know, come through, Irene, et cetera, I'd never seen the ocean quite like that. Sandy left an indelible imprint on the consciousness of the USA. But although huge in size, it was barely a hurricane when it struck land. It is the probability of a similar sized storm undergoing rapid intensification prior to landfall that haunts forecasters. Kind of one of our uh, nightmare scenarios is to have a storm rapidly strengthen as it's nearing land uh, because it can increase the amount of surge, storm surge, the amount of impacts from wind, uh, the stronger the storm gets. Bursts of rapid intensification are common in many of the most famous storms, like Camille in 1969, Katrina in 2005, and perhaps most famous of all, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which leapt from a tropical storm on August 22nd to a Category 5 hurricane at landfall just over a day later. Loosely speaking, though, rapid intensification um, could be 20 knots in 12 hours or something like that. In fact, some of the most famous storms that rapidly intensified, like uh, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, uh, intensified huge, 45 knots in just 12 hours. That's rapid intensification for sure. With little advanced warning, Hurricane Andrew crashed into South Florida and left the unprepared city of Homestead utterly demolished in its wake. The scenario that Noah's hurricane hunters try to ensure never happens again. If you told someone it was going to be a category one, maybe they would decide that it was okay to stay on the beach and not have to pull the boats out, etc. And if it shows up as a category three or category four, literally the storm surge could overwhelm the populace and uh, destroy the boats, the houses, etc. And it could be quite uh, devastating to those people and for the forecasters themselves. Um, no one would believe you the next year. Each and every day as a forecaster, we come in and we assess what our needs are for flying aircraft for the next couple of days. If there's an area of disturbed weather that might form into a, uh, a tropical depression or tropical storm, we will task aircraft to go out and investigate that area of disturbed weather. The only way to get data where on our terms, meaning that we want to collect it, is to go there. For decades, we've flown into the eye of the hurricane. Most of the time, the path that we take to the storm is the direct path. Um, this plane is fast enough, strong enough, and uh, can take pretty much anything so that we want to be as precise as possible. We cut a straight path. We only deviate if we absolutely have to, and we do on occasion. 
Well, the principal role of air ops, who are actually flying in the storm in the hurricane, is to actually get what they say is in situ measurements or measurements in the storm itself, and we can report back to the National Hurricane Center what's actually occurring in real time in the storm itself, because satellites just can't see down through the clouds and the rain. You actually have to send uh, an actual person in, and we do it here in this, this vehicle called a P-3 Orion. Well, the real life experience of rapid intensification is that you brief, and during pre-flight, you'll spend two or three hours preparing the plane and briefing with the scientists. You'll expect one level of storm, and uh, usually it's uh, lower, and then you get to the storm and you have something that's quite a bit different, quite a bit stronger and usually growing. You know, one of the worst scenarios you can be in is a, a tropical storm trying to be a hurricane, which can be quite painful. The hurricane hunters ride the hurricane for as long as their fuel load safely allows them. The data they obtain helping to form a picture of the storm's state of health. What exactly makes a healthy hurricane? The first ingredient is tropical heat over an ocean. So hurricanes are beasts of the tropical Atlantic, Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. Many of the storms have their origins from weather disturbances coming off the coast of Africa, called African Easterly Waves. And most of these systems that come off Africa do not become hurricanes. I would say somewhere on the order of 9 out of 10 do not. So you have to have a lot of things right for it to occur. Between May and November, these African easterly waves progress west across the Atlantic every few days. The next ingredient is a warm ocean with sea temperatures of 79.6 degrees Fahrenheit as the usual trigger point. Air in the form of wind blows across the oceans from regions of high atmospheric pressure to low. As the tropical disturbance travels across the ocean, the winds evaporate heat and moisture from the seawater. The warm, moist air forms more and more thunderstorms, with the air inside them rising upwards by as much as 60,000 feet. So as you get this warming, you get pressures that reduce. And as the pressures start to reduce, you start to get the winds start to um, accelerate towards this incipient disturbance. The winds rush faster and faster towards that low pressure and the growing thunderstorms, which pump hot air into the stratosphere. When that low pressure storm core becomes sufficiently developed, the weather system starts to be influenced by planetary forces. The storm is now ready to grow through the different stages to metamorphose into a hurricane. To measure the strength of the growing storms, the forecasters categorize them by wind speed. As a category one, it will only have sustained winds of between 74 and 95 miles per hour. As a category five, it would need winds of over 157 miles per hour. With the strongest recorded hurricane, having winds sustained at over 190 miles per hour. Storm's fate will be determined to a large extent by atmospheric winds surrounding the system. If they are at different speeds or directions at different heights, they will prevent the storm from growing. What happens? The storm tends to tilt over. Think of it getting decapitated. It doesn't like that. It wants to remain vertical. This difference between wind strengths at height is called shear. If the difference is large, the shear is high and will cut the storm to pieces. If the shear is low, the storm can grow. 
Once in range of the P3 Orions, the NOAA hurricane hunters fly research patterns back and forth through the storm. Measuring atmospheric conditions within a hurricane is vital to determine if wind shear is suitable for intensification. For that, they need to put instruments into the storm itself. So we developed this technology, this drop sond technology. It has sensors here for pressure, temperature, winds, and humidity. And as it drops from the plane, falls down, and within two to three, depending on the altitude we fly, hits, hits the water. But in those few brief minutes, the sons record vital precise observations from the very worst conditions in the weather systems below. During the flight, they drop many hundreds of sons into the hurricane. As they fall, each of them transmits weather data back to the aircraft. Think of it as a picture, a snapshot. It gives us a profile, but where the winds take it tell you where that profile is. So it's not even a vertical profile. The data profiles help to locate the eye, the very center of the storm, where weather conditions are completely benign. When they say hurricane hunter, what you're doing is you're hunting the eye by keeping the wind at your 90 degrees. So as the wind changes, you change the nose of the aircraft until you find the exact center of pressure, low pressure, and the lowest winds, which theoretically are zero. This is also where the most vital core of the growing hurricane is found, the eye wall, the narrow band of intensely convective thunderstorms that encircle the central low pressure eye. The part of a hurricane that energetically is, I would say, the most important is the eye wall. So just beyond that clear eye, there's a ring, or at least an arc, of strong storms. And it's there in the eye wall that all of the mass that's circling in at the surface and then spiraling out at the top, it has to pass up through the eye wall. In fact, it's just sometimes updrafts half a kilometer across. The system is by now a weather heat engine. Warm air in the form of increasing winds spiral towards the eye, where they encounter the convective thunderstorms of the eye wall. The winds are swept high towards the stratosphere where they radiate outwards for thousands of miles. I think of a hurricane as a marathon runner, and I think of thunderstorms as sprinters. They're fast, but then they have to stop. So a hurricane can keep going for weeks, as long as it doesn't hit land and lose its oceanic energy source. But a hurricane is an unpredictable beast that can change intensity in a matter of hours at any time. 